Hi, this is Dr. Claire, and today we're going to be talking about some of the evidence, physical evidence for evolution that we can observe. Um, so, to start, um, probably the most uh, abundant and uh, concrete physical evidence that we have for historical evolution is the fossil record. Um, so, we have uh, a lot of fossils of a lot of different um, transitional forms of plants and animals that show how evolution has proceeded um, throughout time. Um, now, when Darwin originally came up with the theory of evolution by natural selection, the fossil record wasn't as good, and so uh, there weren't as many of these transitional fossils, and that was one of the weaknesses of the theory at the time, but now, as we've continued to add to our collection of fossils that exist, there's a lot of really great evidence for evolutionary transitions through time. So I'm going to give you one example here of the evolution of whales. Now, whales are a mammal, uh, and mammals originally evolved on land. So most mammals are quadrupeds, meaning they have four limbs, and um, they're warm-blooded and they breathe air. Whales have lost their hind two limbs, but they still have many of the same features that other mammals have. Um, the closest living relative of a whale is actually the hippopotamus. Um, so here's, here's our hippo right here. Let's see if I can draw something on this thing. Uh, there's the hippo, right? Um, so the, the, uh, the lineage that produce whales diverged from the lineage that produce hippos uh, sometime in the ancient past, probably around 55 million years ago. Um, and both the branches have persisted throughout that time. So uh, whales did not evolve from a hippo. They evolved from an ancestor of both the hippo and the whale. And that ancestor probably was uh, an animal that looked like this guy down here. This is Pachycetus. Uh, Pachycetus was probably a partially aquatic mammal. Um, they think it probably lived in fresh waters and spent a lot of time swimming, but uh, it was not a completely aquatic animal. It was also able to uh, live on land. So um, it's a pretty, uh, pretty interesting creature. So um, in addition to uh, Pachycetus, there's also several other transitional stages in the evolution of whales that we have fossils for. So we have fossils for an animal called Ambulocetus. And Ambulocetus, that means walking whale, that's the translation of the Latin there. Ambulocetus was probably an animal that uh, was much more aquatic than Pachycetus, probably spent most of its life in the water. Um, and, but it probably still could walk on land, although it was probably more clumsy. So some of the features of Ambulocetus that let you know this is if you look at the hind legs of Ambulocetus here, they are placed towards the back of the body and pointing backwards. That means they were probably used to propel Ambulocetus through the water, but they still has those hind legs. Um, later fossils, such as uh, Durudon, um, the, those limbs, those hind limbs are greatly reduced and almost absent. And you, so at that point, you have the evolution of the tail fluke that the, uh, that animal has used to, uh, to swim through the water. So you can see this gradual progression through the fossil record of both first the movement of those hind limbs further in the back to be used for swimming, and then the complete loss of those hind limbs. Now, um, There's some other evidence within the fossil record for the transition to whales. One of those things is the placement of the nostril. Now, a terrestri terrestrial animal um, has its nostrils placed very far forward on the muzzle, um, and that allows the animal to sniff the ground and sniff for food and things like that. Once you start to become aquatic, however, um, sniffing becomes less important because you don't sniff underwater. And also, the, the, those nostrils become more and more important for the animal to breathe because breathing through the mouth uh, requires the animal to tilt its head up, get its mouth, mouth up and out of the water. It's easier if those nostrils are placed high on the, on the muzzle to just breathe through the nostril. And so what you tend to see in all kinds of aquatic animals that breathe air is that the, the nostrils are placed very high on the skull and um, it, particularly in the, um, the whale evolution, what you see is the nostrils start to move further and further back towards the top of the head to the point where a modern whale will uh, come to the surface of the water and breach up with what looks like the top of its head 
but its nostrils ha are up here on the top of the head, and that allows it to breathe very easily, even though it's in the water. Um, again, here you can also see the gradual loss of limbs from Pachycetus to more aquatic animals to, uh, in, in recent uh, whales, they still do have the remnants of a pelvis, but they are no longer functional bones. That kind of bring, brings us to the idea of a homology. Homologies are similarities within organisms that reflect their evolutionary history. So um, what that means is it's a, a trait that an animal has due to the fact that its common ancestor had that trait as well. So a really great example of a homology is the vertebrate forelimb. Um, so if you look at the front limb of, of pretty much any vertebrate, you're going to see the same pattern of bones. You've got the humerus up at the top of the arm, you've got two bones, the radius and the ulna in the lower part of the arm, and then you generally have five or so digits. Some uh, organisms have lost the, some digits within the hand bones. But those bones can be arranged in very different ways to accomplish the, the uh, life history of the particular animal. So, for example, if you look at something like a, a flighted animal that uses its forelimb for flight, uh, what you see is that um, there's actually two ways to accomplish that. With birds, they actually use their feathers to create the wing, and so they have greatly reduced bones with fewer hand bones than uh, you see in other vertebrates. Whereas bats, rather than using feathers to create the wing, they stretch skin between the bones, so their hand bones are greatly elongated and the, the skin stretches between them. But if you look at the different, at the bones here, they're still the same basic ma makeup. You have your single humerus, your ulna and your radius, and then your hand bones. Um, same goes for a, uh, a walking animal like a lion. Our, our human hand is like that as well. And even the forelimb of something like a whale, it's still the same bones. The forms are just different. So um, that reflects that all vertebrates evolve from a common ancestor, all terrestrial vertebrates evolve from a common ancestor that probably had a similar bone structure. All right. Um, now, sometimes these homologies uh, can uh, arise in scenarios where the particular trait in question uh, no longer serves a function in the current animal. Um, so one great example of that is the pelvis bones of the whale that I was just talking about. They evolved from an animal that had pelvis bones, and gradually over time the hind limbs have become not useful because they're an aquatic animal, and um, gradually over time those hind limbs got smaller and smaller. But whales still have these remnants of the pelvis bone. Those pelvis bone remnants don't really serve any function anymore, so we would call them a vestigial trait. Another vestigial trait you may have heard of is the human appendix. The human appendix is uh, similar in structure to uh, a structure in many um, uh, herbivorous animals called the cecum. The cecum is where herbivorous animals will store uh, uh, bacteria that help them to digest their plant food, which is very difficult to, uh, to digest. And so um, if you look at something like a plant-eating monkey, they do have the cecum. Um, now humans are no longer solely, uh, 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 solely herbivorous, pardon my stuttering, um, and uh, so we eat a lot of diversity of foods, which are general, and we cook. Uh, this generally makes our foods easier to digest, and so we don't need as many of those beneficial bacteria living within our guts, and that region has become reduced over time. So the appendix is now considered a vestigial trait. Here's a vestigial trait you may not have heard of. Um, this little creature here is called an ice fish. The ice fish lives under the Antarctic sheet uh, of ice in Antarctica. That's where you might expect to find the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, and the, the, uh, the ice fish, li living under that ice, the water is extremely, extremely cold. And cold water actually dissolves gases better than hot water. What that means is that um, oxygen is able to dissolve fairly readily into that very, very cold water. Um, and uh, the other thing is that when uh, an animal is very, very cold, they tend to have lower oxygen requirements. What this has added up to is that um, the, this fish requires not very much more oxygen than is just present in the seawater in order to survive. Now, most other animals, most other vertebrates, um, 
require more oxygen, so they need a way to concentrate and transport oxygen around the body. That, the thing that we use for that is called hemoglobin. It's a molecule within our red blood cells that binds oxygen and transports it throughout the body so that we can efficiently deliver oxygen to our tissues. Now, because the ice fish um, has such low oxygen requirements and because its environment is so high in oxygen, um, it, can, it actually is able to survive without hemoglobin. And so this image here is showing you um, ice fish blood. This is ice fish blood. This is normal fish blood. The thing that gives blood its red color is hemoglobin. And so the ice fish has lost uh, an, a functional gene for hemoglobin. It no longer has a gene that produces hemoglobin within its cells. However, if you look at the genetics of an ice fish, you will find the non-functional hemoglobin gene still in its genome. It has some mutations in it that are preventing it from pr uh, producing functional hemoglobin, but that gene is still present. So that gene has now become a vestigial trait. So those are some, I think, some of the more interesting uh, bits of evidence for evolution. Of course, you can also observe evolution happening in real time. And the classic example of this is uh, Peter and Rosemary Grant's research on the Galapagos finch. And you may have heard of some of this research before. Um, I have a picture here of Peter and Rosemary Grant. They're two professors emeritus from Princeton. And they've spent most of their uh, academic careers studying finches on a very small island uh, in the Galapagos. And the nice thing about studying birds on a very small island is that you can actually capture every single bird on the island. So this is this island down here is Daphne Major. Um, that's their island. You can actually walk from side to side on it and you can catch every single bird. So they catch all the birds. This is a medium ground finch, one of the finches that they study down there. And then you can see on this bird's legs, it's been captured and marked with colored leg bands to tell it apart from any other of the finches on the island. So the nice thing about this kind of study is that you can measure every single finch follow them throughout their lives, see how many babies they have, see what, they're, what happens to them, do they survive, do they reproduce, what's going on. And so this very detailed study has allowed them to actually detect evolution happening uh, in this population of Galapagos finches. So what happened is shortly after they started their study, there was a really, really severe drought in 1977 where it basically didn't rain for a year. And when it doesn't rain, the plants on the Galapagos don't bloom. And when they don't bloom, they don't produce seeds. And seeds are the major food source for these finches. So this graph here that I have up is showing um, the average size of uh, seeds on Daphne Major um, during the period of the drought. So at the beginning of the drought, what you see is that um, most seeds are relatively small. But as the drought progressed and no trees or plants bloomed and no plants produced new seeds, all of the small seeds that were available got eaten up and all that was left were these larger seeds. Now these larger seeds look like this. They're really big, they're thorny, they're nasty, they're hard, and they're hard to eat. Now um, these bigger seeds uh, can can really only be eaten by birds who have beaks that can deal with them. And so when we got to 1977 and those were all the seeds that were left, there was a huge population decline on the island. So at the beginning of the drought, they had about 1,400 birds on the island. By the end of the drought, they only had 200. The other 1,200 birds had starved to death because there was nothing for them to eat. Um, now what, what uh, the, the evolution that happened here was that um, there was really, really strong, what's called natural selection, we'll talk about this more, um, on this population of birds where the birds that had the large beaks had a distinct advantage over birds that had smaller beaks. The large beak birds were able to crack these nasty pointy seeds and actually get some food to eat, whereas the small beak birds didn't have anything to eat and didn't, didn't have enough food to survive. So when you look at the beak size over the course of the drought, what you actually see is the blue curve here is representing the, av the beak size of various birds 
um, before the drought. And so the average uh, beak size, as represented by the peak of the curve here, was about nine and a half uh, millimeters. Um, after the drought, when these birds have been subjected to the severe food deprivation and only some, only those big seeds were available, uh, the average beak size was over 10 millimeters. We had a, a large increase in, I mean, a millimeter may not seem like much, but when you're a small bird, that's a big difference. Um, so we had this increase in bill size over a very short period of time, just a matter of a few years. Um, interestingly, when the drought broke and the, um, the plants bloomed and there were small seeds available again, the beak size actually shifted back. And that's because when, you, when their seeds were abundant, the smaller beaked birds had an advantage because they were more easily able to crack and manipulate small seeds. And so they had an advantage over the large, larger birds. All right, that's my uh, little lecture on evolutionary evidence. Uh, catch my next one.